Good morning, everyone. As you make it back to your seats, um, we're just going to begin a time of worship today and just uh, believe God uh, for a great morning and, and just a great time in His presence today. Thanks for making it out. Um, I know it's kind of treacherous out there. Rock is super cold, but we're uh, cozy in here and we're just going to be in it worshiping the Lord.
Sunday to experience me, but yet I'm left at the door. I knock and knock, just waiting to be closer. Open the door. Let me change you. Let me be your friend. Let me be closer. Come on. Let me consume your heart and see the difference your life can be. See the difference in your life. See the difference around your friends and family. See the difference as you drive. See the difference as you experience everyday life. Because there's joy, there's hope, there's peace. Wow, peace. I'm at the door knocking. And as we worship, will you please think about letting me in? I just want the best for you. My heart breaks when your heart breaks. So let me in. Come on. And let me fix your heart. My grace is enough for you. My grace is enough for you. Jesus. Amazing grace, 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, come on, sing it. I was lost but Just be with us 
as we go into the message, God, just continue just un unveiling your truth to us. God, we praise you, man. And we thank you for meeting us here this morning. In Jesus' name. Everyone says, Amen. 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 In anticipation of the poor weather and, you know, less than our half of our congregation being here, I kind of prepared a short message for you today just because we're going to go downstairs, as we said, after we have a full meal, so we hope that you'll stick around and spend some time with us. Um, but while it's short, I think it's a heavy hitter. It was very relevant to me. Um, it's a question everybody asks themselves. So the title of my message, and I don't have slides for this, is why are we here? Why are we here? Why? And I think it's very fitting today because you may find yourself getting out six inches of fresh snow, <laughs> below zero, less than half our people are here. So you might be asking yourself right now, why am I here? <laughs> Why did I get out of bed and come here this morning? I hope it wasn't to hear me because I'm going to let you know. No. I don't know. But don't feel bad because you're not alone. Inevitably, everybody asks themselves this, and it's a lot bigger question than just why are we sitting here right now today. It's an ultimate question that everyone in humanity faces. From the beginning of time, why am I here? Why are you here? And I hope by the end of this short message I have, maybe you'll have a bit better idea of why you're here, or at least question it, take it serious, and give yourself a chance. At any rate, it is a normal question that we've all asked at some point. What's this all for? Is there any purpose for me or my life? Am I here by chance? And it always leads to what's next, right? Everybody's had that thought. What's after this? Where am I going? Am I going anywhere? So to answer that, first you have to kind of decide for yourself, what's your point of reference, right? To answer any question, you're going to have to come to terms with what you think is credible and what you think isn't. For Christians, we believe that the Bible, I was going to hold it up, but I'm using my phone today. We believe that our Bible is our reference point, right? That's what we believe in. That's what we follow. That's where we get our moral values and many other things in life. And while that takes a measure of faith, it does, to trust wholeheartedly in the Bible, it's not blind faith. I think that the world around us gets the idea that this is a blind faith, that you just have to be, okay, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to wing it, and I'm going to trust everything that book says blindly, and that's not the case. And I don't know if I've ever told you that. I don't think I have. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. But it's not a blind faith. And so I want to start with this, again, short message, which is kind of pointing out to you some things that maybe you didn't realize. So the Bible, this book has upheld its claims, its past tests of time, uh, its past tests of man. Before history was ever even recorded, strategically anyway, the Bible was around, the, the beginning works that Moses wrote down was around. So I want to just share some things with you. We'll start with the Old Testament. The Old Testament has hundreds, okay, hundreds of prophecies. About yes. a third of the Old Testament is yes. written prophecies. What that means is that the writer <coughs> was putting something out there that they believed was going to happen. Not that was happening, but was going to happen. Sometime soon, within a few years, sometimes hundreds of years away. And there's hundreds of these. I think it's something like 1,500 prophecies in the Old Testament. And like, it's, I don't have the exact number written down, but somewhere around 13 to 1,400 of those have already happened. Now, just think about that for a second. This is something that they can confirm was written, right? And then hundreds of years later, it happened. How do we explain that? How do you push that away? Look at the New Testament. Jesus himself, just in his life, 
fulfilled over 300 prophecies that reference him specifically in just a 33-year lifespan. Over 300 references to him in the Old Testament were fulfilled in his 33-year lifespan. I had a friend, uh, Malcolm, that preached up here a couple months ago, and he came to a men's group and he pointed out there's this mathematician, uh, he's a professor, and a college professor, and he wrote down kind of an idea of a comparison, um, just to give you kind of a clue of the odds of Jesus fulfilling these prophecies. Because some people do say that. Some people say, oh, you know, that was bound to happen. Somebody was bound to live that life in growing up in that culture, knowing these stories. That's they were right. going to try to live that life out right. and fulfill this prophecy. Amen. So he just broke it down. This mathematician did on what are the odds of that actually happening? Even if you're trying to, what are the odds that you could actually fulfill that? We'll give you some other odds first. So the odds of you being struck by lightning are one in 9,100. Pretty good odds, right? We choose to roll the dice with that. We go out in the storm if we have to, run to our car, run into the store. We'll roll the dice with those odds, right? Is that fair to say? Anybody here been struck by lightning? <laughs> Nobody? Not yet. Not yet. We roll the dice every day, though, don't we? <laughs> Three years ago, the Powerball, Mega, uh, Mega Millions, it got up over a billion dollars. Over a billion dollars. Everybody was playing. Do you know what the odds of winning that were? One in 302,575,350. Wow. How many of you are going to roll the dice on that one? I don't like, the one <laughs> I don't like my odds. Pretty severe odds. I don't like my odds. Not a good shot. So, that brings us to Jesus. This mathematician calculated what are the odds that he could come and fulfill all of these prophecies in the exact way they were supposed to be met and do that even on his own turn, whatever. What are the odds that he could do that? And it said that this team worked for months to figure out this number. It came to be 1 in 10 to the 157th power. What that means is, put, see a 10? And then put 157 zeros behind it. Yeah. 157 zeros behind it. But we trust the odds just for that one in 9,000 with the lightning. So why can't we trust those odds? Where's the disconnect? If we're just thinking of it mathematically. The same. But we can go on with that. We can go on with this. Um... In case that's not enough proof for you, do you know that there is thousands, over a thousand, thousands of written accounts of Jesus' life that aren't in the Bible? Just from eyewitnesses of the time? Yes, How do they oh, know about that? How do they know about that? People How keep record of that. People keep record of that. Oh. Okay. They had historians and stuff in Jesus' okay. time. Glad you brought that up. Josephus was one of them. <laughs> Jewish <laughs> and Jewish. Roman historians. Accounted and confirmed. There are books written that are Hebrew books and Roman books. These aren't Christ followers. These aren't Christians. And yet they wrote an account. There's multiple written accounts. Thousands of eyewitnesses that say they saw him. That say he did what he did. Now they choose to reject him still. They didn't want to follow him. But they acknowledge that what he said he did, he did. Another point to that book. Do you know that in history, you can look this up for yourself, call me a liar if I'm not telling you the truth. There has never been one archaeological find that has disproven writings, prophecies, or like where thing, uh, placement, geography of the Bible to prove that it was inaccurate in any way, shape, or form. And as a matter of fact, there's been hundreds to support it. You may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you don't know what those are, they found them in the 40s. Uh, in a pit. They dug it out in a cave, rather. They find these writings, thousand, over 2,000 years old. They find these writings. They get them out. They're careful with them. They translate them. I'll give you an example. The book of Isaiah, one of the biggest books in the Old Testament. They translate this book 
It was within two words of what we have today in the King James. And they were both words that were like <laughs> it and for. What we have is what they have. I say that to say that. What we have is accurate. It's not an altar. People say, oh, man has changed it over. No, they haven't. They've tried. They've certainly tried. But we still have what they have. And as you can see, if you've been taught this before or not, it doesn't matter. Just by the proof, just by the evidence. If I was telling you this about anything that wasn't supernatural, you'd lay down your guard, right? You'd say, okay, that's accurate. That's fair. But when it comes to the Bible, some people were, yeah, I don't know. Just go with the proof. That's all I'm asking. It's been followed time and time again. So when I tell you that I'm going to explain this question to you that we asked in the beginning of why we're here, I'm going to do it biblically, and I believe that I can do that because we do have proof. We do have evidence. This isn't blindly followed. And if you'll accept that book for what it says it is, for what history has told us it is, you'll know all you need to know about your existence, your why, your how, those questions that we naturally want answered. It has. That's good news for us. And at the end of the day, we get into this long, drawn-out debate, even in the Bible. We get into this theological debate of what does it really say we're here for? What does it say we're supposed to do? Why did he create us? And we could argue that. We could go around for hours. This could be a super long sermon. But at the end of the day, I'm going to read you Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. And it's Jesus talking. There were, the Pharisees were gathered around at the time. And one of the lawyers, it says, which was really well versed in the law, which is all the Old Testament, right? He said to him, he said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets is referring to the Old Testament. It all boils down to this. Real simple. We don't got to overcomplicate it. We love to overanalyze things, don't we? We live in a society of overthinkers, and I tend to be one of them sometimes. But it all boils down to love God and love people. So, and you can prioritize your life over just those two things. But if you fail to do one, you're failing to do both, he says. They're that important. They go that hand in hand. When we ask this question of why we're here, though, it's a tough one, isn't it? It's tough. Let's be honest. Even as Christians, it's still hard to think of, oh, why would he put me here? Why now? Why do I have the family I have? Why do I have the home I have? Why do I'm I? Off. Why am I here? Right. It's tough. It's tough for me even to stand up here every Sunday. Why? Amen. But we have to face it, don't we? Some people ignore that. But we have to face it. We have to face the reality of our existence. That's right. As odd and as challenging as it is, we're here. Deal with it, right? We have to. And in that same sense, we have to deal with our mortality. Oh, now that one's even worse, right? Some say they'll talk to you about why about why we're here, but they don't want to talk about where we're going. Yeah. Those are two very important questions. Two very important questions that I asked. Good. Yeah? I, well, I'll talk to you later about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we do. We're faced with it. We have to think about it. We have to talk about it. We can't avoid it, right? They say there's two things you can't avoid. Does anybody remember what they are? Death and taxes. Death and taxes. <laughs> you can try to evade both, but you can't. So I told you the reasons we could trust this book. I, I hope that you at least found some truth in that. Well, then we have to trust what it says. If you trust the book, you've got to trust what it says. 
And it says that you are just here temporarily. And it says that you're going to spend an eternity somewhere else. I heard it said once. It's like if you're staring at the desert. You take a pinch of sand. And that's your life. And the rest of that sand is your eternity. And we can't fathom that as humans. We can't grasp that. Probably don't bother trying. But it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a long time. And you, the Bible says we're going to spend that in one of two places. We're either going to spend it in a glorious paradise with Jesus and with our loved ones who died before us that knew him and loved him and followed him. Or we're going to spend it in a place of torment, separated from God and probably separated from all other people. A place of darkness, it says. And that's not to get doom and gloom on you. It's just, it's just what it says. Right? If we can't preach that, what can we preach? So this place we live in now is just that, like I said, that pinch of sand. That's where we're at right now. But what you do with your pinch of sand determines that whole desert. All of those endless dunes of sand, right, is determined by this little pinch. So to boil this all down, why are we here? I told you I'd be short. I'll wrap up with this. Your purpose, your only mission on earth, only thing you have to accomplish, only thing that you have to get right. We make a lot of mistakes, don't we? Yes. We got to get one thing right while we're here. Just one thing. You follow Jesus. That's all it says. When it really boils down to it, you can mess up everything else Amen. in your life. But if you get that one thing right, Hallelujah. it'll work out. Hallelujah. It'll work out. Hallelujah. And we do that by following Him. We do that by accepting Him. We do it by Hallelujah. praying to Him, spending life with Him. So, Hallelujah. right? There's not a ton of us here. But if you haven't, good news is you can start. And if you already are, bring some people with you. Serve God. Serve God. Yeah. Serve God yeah. Oh, that's, that's, okay. yeah. that's it. That's my message for you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, you you formed us all. You see, you see how naturally, I mean, from the world around us, Lord, it's so easy to be so untrusting. It's so easy to question things. It's so easy to not believe. Faith is hard sometimes, God. So I thank you, Lord, that you didn't just leave us hanging with your word. I thank you that you didn't leave us without any proof. I thank you that we don't have to blindly follow. It still takes a measure of faith, but you've given us so much ground to stand on that faith. So I praise you for that, God. I pray you'd have mercy on us, Lord, on everyone here. Yes. yes Lord. I thank you, God, that we can come together and worship you. I really thank you for these that are here specifically, God, because they brave the weather. It's always hard to get out of bed when it's cold and it's snowing, God. But we're here. So I pray that you would bless these people just for being here, God. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for all you've done in our lives. We acknowledge to you, Lord, not one of us is worthy to even come to you for you. Not at all, Lord. But yet you want us. You desire us before we'll ever desire you. So thank you for that. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray a blessing over the food we're about to enjoy. I pray there would be good conversation, God. And I just thank you that we can get together, even on a cold day like this, and be warm in our hearts. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.